Hello and welcome. I'm Craig Waters, Editor of Global Railway Review, and joining me today on this video is Jeremy Husky, Chief Architect at Nomad Digital. Jeremy, really great to see you and thanks so much for joining me again. Craig, good to see you again. It's got to be at least 18 months. <laughs> It really is. And um, actually, that's a, a really good way to start us off. Um, for those that, that don't know, we actually both um, spoke on another video um, back in June 2021. Um, and uh, at that time, um, you know, a couple of years ago, um, we were starting to get back to a little bit of normality um, post pandemic lockdowns. And we were talking about what the railways should focus on to entice passengers back to rail travel. And you were actually saying that you thought it was um, going to be really important for operators to um, make train journeys enjoyable, simple and smart um, and to move forward with the idea of intelligent and connected journeys. So um, I just wanted to kick off by asking your thoughts on what progress, if any, um, that you think has been made in the industry since we last spoke um, and your general thoughts about rail industry success post pandemic. I think it's probably best to say the uh, the rail industry really suffered through the pandemic, and coming out of it, uh, it's it's been a challenging time. I think rail operators have done a great job to to make their services uh, easier for customers, uh, slick for customers, and safer for customers. Specifically, you know, we've seen uh, a lot more adoption of the ticketless journey, so touchless journey, in effect. Uh, the, there's a greater awareness of announcements and actually pushing information to passengers, and uh, uh, and that was a great thing to do. But um, sadly, the the pandemic has kind of caused a very much a sea shift in the way that people view work and the way that companies view how people should work. Um, and even though there's been a pretty good rally in terms of the number of people coming back to rail it's still not at pre-pandemic levels. I think the Office of Road and Rail in their last report, uh, which came out last September, basically said it's roughly 80%. Uh, in the UK, obviously, there's been a few rail strikes, which will impact that number on the way that it moves forward, but it's, it's still nothing like pre-pandemic levels in the way that it works. So, it's an ongoing challenge for uh, for the rail operators and anyone working in the kind of rail industry. A um, couple of interesting shifts in passenger habits. I think the migration of people moving towards leisure travel on the rail has has increased quite significantly as opposed to pre-pandemic levels. So if there's one positive big change, it's, it's that. Um, but we still need to do a lot more to kind of encourage people back to work. The government's already doing this. We've seen multiple announcements on that. That's in the UK. Um, so that drive is good. Um, but again, you know, it's 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 a whole uh, envelope of things that you bring to people to make them want to kind of, you know, go back to the office. And uh, And sadly, we're not there yet. Hopefully, in the next 12 months, when we speak again, that'll be uh, a different story from that. Absolutely. So um, more more needs to be done. Um, we, we've made some gains in in some respect, but but more needs to be done to to move forward. So um, that's really great to hear. Yeah. yeah no, exactly. Good. Okay. So um, moving on, um, I wanted to explore with you today the um, the theme of telecommunications in the railway industry and why telecoms and the exchange of information is of strategic importance for the industry. So um, I guess the, the function of telecommunications within railway organisations, although it's not new, um, is actually becoming increasingly important, um, especially with the continuation of um, rail becoming more digital with um, traffic management and monitoring of assets and um, passenger connectivity and so much more. So would you agree that railway telecoms is a function that is now more important than ever um, and, and why? That's a really good point. I think... Um... In a simple way, absolutely. 
railway telecoms is is critical now and it's it's critical really because every rail operator has a strategy for the digital train the digital railway the benefits that digitizing services bring to you uh, in terms of efficiency of operation knowledge of operation insight into the way that the operations work the greater the data that you collect uh, at the forefront the greater the need for throughput back to a central source. And what we really are seeing is uh, an accelerated push now for uh, connectivity in the rail environment, which is driving a lot of these new applications. It's actually an enabler for the new applications that are coming forward. So um, it's a really exciting time actually to be part of this. And what we are seeing is a migration away from uh, the legacy world of GSMR, as as you're fully aware, to FRMCS, Future Railway Mobile Communication System, which will really ramp up how the rail industry utilizes rail telecoms for applications going forward. Great. So, um, you know, you you mentioned about ramping up um, the the way things are used. Um, Is there an actual um, need to to drive forward with um, modernising and improving the reliability um, and resilience of of route telecoms? Um, Are we um, stuck with with old systems that need to be um, upgraded? Um, What would you say? Um, So the rail industry has... a long history of legacy systems that were designed for a period of time that are still in operation that should have been end of life uh, previously. um, And we are still scrambling around to try and keep those systems in operation today. I think FRMCS and the modernization question really is a bit of a bombshell to the rail industry because we're effectively going from you know second generation mobile technology so effectively 2g and we're making the entire jump missing out all the in between of going straight to 5g the fifth generation uh, of mobile technology which in anyone's book is a big is a big step it's a big learning curve in the rail environment but it's it's a huge step from a technology type of background um it's not just the radio protocol that is going to change and will be impacted. Um, you know, when we built GSMR networks uh, back in the day, it would have been based on something like SDH technology over, over fiber optic cable. SDH, really strong, very resilient uh, as a technology of moving it forward. Unfortunately, it's, it's capacity limited. And what we're seeing now with the new generation of radio technologies is capacity is is becoming the big thing that moves the needle for everyone so how how performant is it and you need the underlying ip transmission structure to give you and enable that new radio based technology going forward so uh, a packet based core which is an ip based network in the back end, which is highly scalable, resilient, uh, and obviously in in today's world, secure for the cyber environment because, you know, cyber attacks are just everywhere at the moment. Uh, So that's critical and key for us. Um, But FRMCS is really putting a Bunsen burner under the industry in terms of the way that we're keeping the heat on it because uh, people are saying, GSMR goes end of life 2030. We know we can extend that in terms of uh, a spare allocation, but there are a lot of operators in Europe, rail operators, who are looking at pushing the boundaries now and doing very early tests on FRMCS. Uh, Alstom, Nomad's parent company, is highly active in the standards body in the UIC uh, in defining what the standards will look like for FRMCS. And we pretty much believe that by 2025, that's going to be crystallized um, and some key rail operators will be doing important trials at that point. And we think we're going to see the first live operations pretty much in 2027 as per the schedule that people have published around FRMCS. So 
it's a really exciting time and it's a positive time to be part of the rail industry. I mean, putting a broadband radio network, uh, train to ground the covers, train operations, mission critical work, uh, and the passenger experience uh, under one umbrella is, is very new for this industry and very exciting. So, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. It is exciting. And actually, 2027 is not that far away. So um, we're going to see a lot of changes um, soon, aren't we? So um, exciting to see um, what's to come. Yeah, no, no, no. We, you know, we love being part of it. Um, Alstom has got... Uh, Got a lot of experience in the kind of pre-FRMCS deployments uh, and the way that that looks. So we're building our experience up in that, in the way that it goes forward. And we're working with our customers to kind of build um, strategies for them to adopt this, you know, quickly and, and effectively. Okay, good. So actually, um, sticking with uh, you know Nomad Digital um, as a company, you, you offer a range of solutions that ultimately, of course, benefit both passengers and the operators. Um, so what advice would you give to um, a railway organisation that is looking to upgrade or overhaul their telecoms um, networks? Should they think a little bit more strategically? Um, should they approach um, things in a certain way? Um, but also, could you explain a little bit more about the benefits um, of, of upgrading um, telecoms networks? You know, maybe not just the immediate benefits, but the future benefits of, of doing just that. Mm, that's a good point. The, the one thing we would impress um, on our customer base, and this isn't a criticism, it, it tends to be a, a way that projects play out, is telecoms are not an afterthought, but they're not at the forefront of people's thinking in the way that services will be delivered. Uh, obviously, the application takes the forefront and the application drives the need, and the need tends to be what telecoms network do you need now to support that application. From, from our perspective, it's, okay, what does the train of the future in five years' time look like? And what do we need to do to align with that so that because things change relatively slowly in the rail world compared to, you know, the external world of IT and telecoms. So I think we've almost, to our rail operators, I think the advice would be what's over the horizon and what is the best way of setting yourself up now for, you know, a capital expenditure or a program of works that allows you to reap all the benefits over that period of time uh, to when we get to the horizon, when you can do it again. So we tend not to be in this forever catch-up loop of deploying stuff that takes a long time, and by the time you've deployed it, it's almost end of life, and you're not seeing the full benefits of the technology that you've pushed out into the marketplace. It's, it's a really tough question to answer in that regard. Because it's it's a lot of what do we need now and what does the application need now that drives what gets put in the ground. So when you look at how people consume data these days, and I mean uh, passengers and people in their normal lives consume a huge amount of data. When they take a passenger experience on a train, that's what they're expecting at that point. That they're moving from one world into the mobility world and the mobility world still gives them the same level of um, digital connectivity that they get, you know, in the office at home, uh, even in a coffee shop uh, to that regard. So it, it's a challenging question. Um, <laughs> it's, it's one that a few people have got the uh, a reasonable solution to as we stand there. Absolutely. And, you know, looking ahead and looking to the future is, is something that um, the industry is always, always doing. Um, you know, a lot of change has got to happen. Um, we've got to adapt and we've got to shift. Um, and everyone knows that. Um, so, you know, talking about, um, you know, what the future holds in your day to day role, Jeremy, um, as being responsible for kind of architecture of solutions and, and innovations, how do you see rail telecoms evolving in the future? Um, how much more advanced will things be? Um, and um, what do you think we will be talking about in maybe five years or so? Interesting. 
the probably the biggest shift change and sea change we've seen in the last 18 months has been the deployment of 5G. Now, 5G is coming out in stages, um, as most people will know. It's coming out in various flavors of 5G. Um, you can get the ultra fast millimeter wave level 5G, which gives you, you know, a gigabit to your handset, very low latency, you know, download a film in seconds, that type of environment to a rural environment where most of the railways are, where your um, sub one gigahertz in frequency, you've got a very small channel size. It still says 5G on your mobile, but actually the throughput's pretty poor. If anything, it's no better than what you you see today. So we're we're looking forward to the whole mobile industry catching up with where 5G is going to be and seeing a wider propagation of, of the benefits of 5G coming out. Um, so I think in the next five years, that's an absolute must. Um, <clears throat> obviously, from a rail operation standpoint, FRMCS leans heavily on 5G on the way that that's going to go. So we are, are going to see that come in within the next five years. Mm -hmm. um, and really, it's it's down to the applications aspect of what greater connectivity brings to the railway. And I think we're going to see more and more Internet of Things come in with the application of rail telecoms, you know, taking that next step. So we are seeing a huge amount of sensors being put on vehicles these days. Uh, we're doing predictive asset management, not only of vehicles and rolling stock, but of asset infrastructure at the wayside. So the more and more that this brings to bear, I think we're going to see that explode. And that will also drive the demand for throughput and railway telecoms on the back of it. So it's almost chicken and egg. We're almost in a race to get the kind of telecoms infrastructure out there so you can support these applications before people push the applications and then you've got to catch up with telecoms uh, on the back of that. Um, artificial intelligence. Um, the more sensors you put into a railway and on a vehicle, the more data you're going to gather. The more data you've got, the more insight into the way that this operates and your railway is operating. Uh, and for us, artificial intelligence will be another key driver in the way that this goes. We'll see the uh, the application of machine learning on, on large amounts of data as well that will pick up faults. Uh, trends, um, the way the service is being utilized, which is also another good insight for a rail operator is to know how passengers utilize their service uh, and what they do and don't do in the same way that, you know, a vehicle does it or, you know, the fixed infrastructure kind of works on the back of that. Um, and probably topping it off, we're going to start to see the introduction of the very early version of 6G, where 6G is 5G with artificial intelligence kind of built around the edge of that. So they're going to kind of closer uh, or knit closer the user, the application and the technology in the way that that goes forward. So 6G is going to be very interesting in the way that comes on board. Wow, good. I'm interested to hear more about 6G um, as and when we move forward. So um, lots of exciting things to look forward to and lots of innovations, it sounds like, that... Um, the industry oh, will, be, uh, will be using more of, so good. Um, great. And, and finally, Jeremy, um, in the news recently, there was an announcement that um, Nomad Digital had, had won a contract by Caltrain, um, which is a commuter rail line um, in California, um, yep. which I believe was to supply and implement, um, operate and maintain um, a turnkey trackside radio network and onboard services. Um, I believe that's to the San Francisco to um, San Jose um, rail corridor, um, which Correct. sounds really exciting. So I was wondering if there's um, more information that you can tell us about that project, um, how it will you know, benefit passengers, and of course, what the positives are going to be for, for the operator. Sure, it's pretty much hot off the press. Um, so Nomad and one of the other Alstom affiliated companies, actually wholly owned by Alstom again, B&C, um, we have bid this project with Caltrain, and Caltrain have had the foresight to look at the type of services they want to offer to their, their traveling passengers, 
and the type of applications they can bring to the party in terms of operational telecoms to the train and operational applications needing uh, high bandwidth telecoms to the train. So taking that into their own hands and controlling it and, and building your own trackside network gives you the ability to control the um, the quality and the consistency of the type of service you offer. Um, and these guys had the foresight to kind of bring that to the party. Uh, I think the element that Nomad and BNC and some of our um, sub suppliers have brought to the party here um, is effectively a gigabit train. It's the ability to push very high throughput bandwidth to the train and from the train, um, which then in turn allows Caltrain to offer passengers on the train um, a closer at home broadband experience as opposed to a rather poor dial up experience, which you can, uh, you know, <laughs> experience on certain routes. I'm not going to say any more on the back of that, but. That's one of the key benefits that will come from this. It's the new applications Caltrain can deploy and the passenger experience that Caltrain passengers will enjoy over the coming five years on the back of this technology. Um, it will kind of um, allow us to, uh, to build with Caltrain some greater applications that, you know, today we don't know about, but you know, that's uh, that's for us to explore over the coming couple of years. Good. So sounds like um, there's going to be um, a big change uh, for Caltrain passengers and um, what they're going to experience and their future of travel. So um, it's always really good to to hear, um, you know, experts like yourself talk about what the future holds for the industry and then, um, you know, talking about a project that's, that's happening right now and um, how things are changing within the industry and, and what's being done to, to move things forward. So that's um, that's uh, really great to know. And, and that's uh, unfortunately all the time we've got, Jeremy, but um, thanks for your views on this topic. Um, sounds like there is a, a real need for shifting um, to a more strategic approach to improving telecoms um, in rail. Um, so um, thanks for sharing um, your views. And it will be good to see how things evolve um, in this space over the coming years. And when we next speak, um, you know, how things have moved on further and what we can talk about then. So um, thanks, uh, thanks for your time today. That's great. Thank you, Craig. Cheers. Thank you.